It's the D.L. Hughley Afternoon Show weekdays. A panel of federal judges rejected Alabama's latest congressional map today, ruling that a new map needed to be drawn because Republican lawmakers had failed to comply with orders to create a second majority black district or something close to it. In a sharp rebuke, the judges ordered that the new map be independently drawn, taking the responsibility away from the Republican-controlled legislature while chastising state officials who ultimately did not even nurture the ambition to provide the required remedy. That's a direct quote from the court. Americans' feelings about higher education have turned sharply negative. The percentage of young adults who said that a college degree is very important fell to 41% from 74%. Only about a third of Americans now say they have a lot of confidence in higher education. Among young Americans in Generation Z, 45% say they say that a high school diploma is all you need today to ensure financial security. And in contrast to the college-focused parents of a decade ago, now almost half of American parents say they prefer, prefer that their children not enroll in a four-year college. The impeachment trial of Ken Paxson, the Republican Attorney General of Texas, began this morning on the floor of the state Senate in Texas. 31 members are gathered to weigh allegations of corruption and abuse of office and decide on Mr. Paxson's fate. Paxson is facing 20 articles of impeachment and allegations that he used his office to benefit an Austin, Texas real estate figure. Former Proud Boy leader Henry Enrique Tario was sentenced today to 22 years in prison for disrupting the peaceful transfer of presidential power in the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot. Uh, to, uh, Enrique, as he is known by, was convicted of seditious conspiracy and obstructing the congressional proceeding meant to confirm the 2020 presidential election as part of a riot that U.S. District Judge Timothy J. Kelly said broke America's long democratic tradition of peaceful transfers of power. The prison term for Enrique was the most severe penalty handed down so far to any of the more than 1,100 people charged in connection with the Capitol attack. And Tennessee State Representative Gloria Johnson, one of the three Democrats reprimanded this year for leading a protest against gun violence on the state House floor, has launched a bid for the U.S. Senate in her deep red home state of Tennessee. The saga raised Johnson's profile among Democrats across the country, and it gives her a jolt of momentum as she embarks upon a difficult task, dethroning GOP Senator Marsha Blackburn in a state that hasn't elected a Democratic senator in more than three decades. A state judge ruled over the weekend that a Florida redistricting map pushed by Republican Governor Ron DeSantis violates the state constitution and is prohibited from being used for any future U.S. congressional elections since it diminishes the ability of black voters in North Florida to pick a representative of their choice. The judge sent the plan back to the Florida legislature with instructions that lawmakers should draw a new congressional map that complies with the Florida Constitution. Now, this decision was the latest to strike down new congressional maps in southern states over concerns that they violate Blacks' constitutional rights as well as dilute Black voting power. Well, we expected this. Trump's co-defendants are already starting to turn against him. In court documents and hearings, lawyers for people in Trump's orbit, both high-level legal advisors as well as lesser-known associates, are starting to reveal glimmers of a tried-and-true strategy in cases with many defendants. Many are portraying uh, themselves as hapless pawns while piling blame on Trump, the apparent kingpin. For example, Jenna Ellis has started to turn on the former president as he is not paying her legal fees in the Georgia uh, case involving 19 defendants, 
And Jenna Ellis is one of those defendants that has been charged under the Georgia RICO statute. Jenna Ellis, a lawyer, has become a more vocal supporter of Trump's main rival in the GOP 2024 presidential primary, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And Donald Trump spent his Labor Day weekend planning a revenge tour. And no, this isn't a musical tour. This is Donald Trump's commitment to using the arms of justice if he is elected to president uh, to get back at, to uh, exact revenge on those that he believes are responsible for his federal and state criminal cases. Uh, when asked uh, over the weekend in an interview about what he might do if elected president as it relates to those he believe are responsible for his indictments, he basically said, uh, I've got to go after them in the same way that they have come after me. He said he has no choice. You are listening and watching Ariva Martin in real time. And I'm your host, Ariva Martin. This is your one-stop destination for today's trending news, expert analysis, and my unfiltered opinions. In this hour, I'm joined by two of my favorite contributors. And these are regular professors who I'm sure are going to have a lot to say about Americans uh, poo-pooing higher education. Uh, Dr. Larry Walker from the University of Central Florida is here. And Dr. Omi Kongo Dabinga from American University is also joined me in this hour. And in hour two, you know what we do. We go deep and we dig behind the headlines on some of the biggest stories of the day. Some of these stories make gigantic headlines and others have really enormous impact. Well, today we are talking about the Supreme Court and the recent relevant revelations that justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito have received substantial gifts from conservative donors who have business before the court. Now, in the wake of these revelations, just today, Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse sent a letter to Chief Justice John Roberts demanding that the Supreme Court's Chief Justice take some kind of action over this uh, very unusual interview that Justice Samuel Alito gave, where he basically said Supreme Court justices have unfettered power, that Congress, the Senate, no other branch of government could impose any ethic standards or rules of conduct on them, that they were this untouchable, autonomous body. So today we're asking how can Supreme Court justices who are given the highest level of responsibility in terms of dictating and having the final say on laws that impact all of us, how can these nine justices engage in conduct that if you or I did would surely get us fired from almost any job? Yet these justices uh, seem to be rewarded for this conduct. They seem to get <clears throat> more trips on private jets and more perks. I'm going to talk to some Supreme Court experts on uh, what's going on with the courts and ask the question, is it time to have a major overhaul of our Supreme Court in light of these revelations about uh, private jets, vacations, and this arrogance of Justice Alito that they are essentially kings. So stay with us in hour two. But before I bring on my guests, here's what I'm thinking in real time. And I love when I get to talk about some happy news. And this is really good news for Black folks. And yes, it looks like we're having a moment. And I will say a moment again. And this is at least in the world of tennis. If you thought Serena and Venus Williams' influence on American tennis was done, you were wrong. You need look no further than the 2023 U.S. Open to see how Black tennis players are not only thriving, but taking over the sport. So, you know, you think about Black athletes in basketball and football, track and field, but move over world of tennis because Black folks are are coming for you. And for the first time in the sports open era, which began in 1968, when both professionals and amateurs could compete in grand slams, four, four black American players have made it to the quarterfinals of the New York-based major championship. 
Now, coming into the Grand Slam with wins at hard court tournaments in D.C. and Cincinnati is Coco Goff. She is an African-American superstar tennis player who is the favorite to win her first title at this year's U.S. Open. And all eyes are on this 19-year-old phenom as she looks to win this major title. Also, if you think it's just one black woman, you are sorely mistaken. There are several black women who are doing their thing at the U.S. Open in Queens. Uh, also, Madison Keys, another super talented African-American superstar player. And depending on how Madison continues to play, she and Coco literally could face each other. And if that's not enough representation, two black men will also face off in the quarterfinals. In the men's draw 2022 U.S. Open semifinalist Francis Tiafo and dynamic, the dynamic young star Ben Shelton. Both of these are black men. They're going to face off tonight in this highly anticipated prime time matchup. Uh, now, TFO is the higher ranked player and has more Grand Slam experience. So because of that, he's the favorite. However, nobody is counting out Shelton, who is a dynamic player and who has been notching wins over top seed players and quickly moving up the ranks. And the good thing about this story in terms of Francis TFO and Ben Shelton, not only are they fierce competitors, they are also great friends. And this will be their first match on the uh, professional tennis tour. Uh, ben has wanted to play Francis and Francis is kind of this charismatic, he's kind of tennis player, kind of athlete that talks a lot of trash. So uh, he is making this matchup between the two of them even more exciting. And again, adding to the tournament's black excellence theme, Ben Shelton is going to partner with another one of these female black superstars. Her name is Taylor Townsend. Both of them have made it to the semifinals of the mixed doubles. So uh, you could, I can only imagine, I'm sure you too, that tennis greats, Arthur Ashe, who that stadium in Queens is named after, uh, and female tennis great Althea Gibson, both of them must be doing the happy dance in heaven. These young black superstar tennis players are truly the hopes and dreams of not only Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson, but of our ancestors. And we are all here for it. When we come forward, more of today's trending news with my expert contributors right here on KBLA Talk 1580. If you're not listening to Tavis Smiley weekday mornings on KBLA Talk 1580, you're missing out. Everybody wants to talk to Tavis. That's one reason, by the way, why I'm so thrilled to have this conversation with you today. The three people I always most hoped would interview me were Phil Donahue, Studs Turkle, and Tavis Smiley. Donahue's retired, Turkle's deceased, so this is a real thrill for me. And the reason why I have such respect for what you do is you have a historically informed conversation of depth and detail. Be sure to tune in to Tavis Smiley, weekday mornings, 9 a.m. to 12 noon, on your unapologetically progressive radio station, KBLA Talk 1580. Is the pen mightier than the sword? They say the pen is mightier than the sword. At KBLA Talk 1580, we not only have a lot to talk about, we have a lot to write about. Politics, relationships, business, empowerment, and culture. The all-star roster at KBLA Talk 1580 has you covered. That's what it's all about. Be sure to follow us on all our socials for our latest book releases, op-eds, essays, and commentaries from our hosts. And, of course, download the KBLA 1580 app as we strive to remain your most trusted, credible, and reliable source for the issues you care about. This, this is unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 1580. What a baby. I'm young, gifted, and black. At KBLA Talk 
LA Talk 1580, we do more than just talk. Hey there, I'm Jared Hill, president of the National Association of Black Journalists of Los Angeles, and I just want to say thank you for the benevolent $10,000 donation and scholarships for the next generation of black journalists. And I'm Haywood Galbraith, photojournalist and founder of the Minority Photojournalism Institute. Thanks, KBLA, for your generous $10,000 scholarship gift to help us train the next generation of black photojournalists. Congratulations to all the students who will benefit from the scholarship dollars raised at our Black History Month luncheon honoring black legends in L.A. media. When we come forward at KBLA Talk 1580, we're bringing everybody with us. Everybody with us. In a survey conducted by the public opinion research firm Eviteris, KBLA Talk 1580 consistently emerged as the station of choice for black audiences in the Los Angeles media market and beyond. The survey also revealed that the vast majority of black audiences are concerned about the lack of black-owned media and are more likely to listen to talk radio that focuses on issues that impact the black community. For some reason, the other talk stations haven't quite figured that out. If you think about KFI, well, KFI only has like a 3% black listenership. 3%. So there's a good 97% out there to support a station like KBLA. At KBLA Talk 1580, we've got your we've black. You're listening to Reva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Reva Martin. And in this hour, we are tracking today's trending news with my expert contributors, Dr. Larry Walker and Dr. Omikongo Dabinga. These are two regular superstar contributors who are going to help us make sense of today's news. And in hour two, we're talking about the Supreme Court and asking, is it time to do a complete overhaul of our highest court of the land? All right, Dr. Walker, the theme of today is Republicans trying to redraw maps in their states to basically eviscerate black political power, even when the Supreme Court tells them that in doing so, they are violating the Constitution and federal voting rights laws. The Alabama case in particular, the Supreme Court struck down efforts by that legislature to uh, redraw the maps in a way that eliminated one of the two black voting districts in Alabama. They sent the case back uh, to the state, told the lawmakers to get it right. And those defiant Republican legislators drew another map, which they knew did not provide for those two black voting districts. And then uh, Ron DeSantis, who's the governor of Florida, running for president as a Republican candidate, is a lawyer from a law school. The name will go unnamed for obvious reasons. Uh, read that decision, knew what the Supreme Court said, yet he tried to eliminate a black district in Florida that would have wiped out a seat of a sitting black congressman in Florida. What is going on with these Republican lawmakers and their refusal to follow even their own conservative Supreme Court's rulings. Yeah, I, you know, Ariva, I, this is like, you know, we talk about this idea of grievance is is like cubed, you know, this idea, you know, of somehow the system doesn't work um, for, for particularly for, you know, like white males in, in general. But what we're seeing here is this trying to bring us back to Jim Crow to <laughs> essentially, you know, de jure policies that fortunately ended in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And so we've seen, and when I, and I think we need to go back, you started to notice 2013, Shelby County versus Holder. And yeah. so since then, we've continued to see Republicans in, in states, particularly red states, try to continue to erode the you know, Voting Rights Act. And we have to continue to keep fighting for this. Specifically, let's talk about Florida for a second, because the, the, the governor even though the state legislature was opposed to it, did draw a new map that eliminated a black congressional district in Jacksonville, the same city in which a you know white supremacist killed several black people. It's important to note that. Yes. So he knew that this was that the that, you know that the map that they drew was illegal, and then so the you know unfortunately the state had to spend I don't know thousands of tens of thousands of dollars to fight a losing battle. Um, but it, it, and also with Alabama and Georgia, you see you see a consistent pattern here. And once again, to you know reverse you know the Voting Rights Act, which is you know just kind of hanging on by a thread. But we can't allow these this to continue. And fortunately, we have civil rights activists like yourself and others who are out there fighting 
um, the women, uh, League of Women Voters, et cetera, NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, et cetera, fighting for these issues to make sure you can't dilute the black vote. I'm so glad, uh, Dr. Walker, you brought up uh, that this district that uh, DeSantis tried to eliminate in Florida is in Jacksonville that has a very large black population and that this is the same city where the white supremacists shot three innocent black people in the Dollar General store. So, Dr. Dabinga, why is it when Ron DeSantis went into Jacksonville after that horrific mass, uh, you know, racially motivated shooting, what made him think he could go step into a vigil with black people, offer some, you know, thoughts and prayers, a million dollars to the black college where the gunman had stopped to put on his armor and that he was going to be well received when he is engaged in the most concerted anti-black policy initiatives that you can imagine from eliminating AP black history in, in schools to advancing this fake mm -hmm. narrative about slavery to eliminating this black voting district. So all of this is in the background as he tries to step into this black community to somehow show himself presidential, show himself as, as the leader of the people in the state of Florida when all along he is stabbing black people, not just in the back, he's stabbing us in the eye. So we see mm. him coming and we see mm. him going. But what do you think gives him that kind of hubris? At the end of the day, there's no real respect for our community. That's why they can target us in the curriculum and other things like in ways that they don't do to any other groups on this level. And to be quite honest, one of the things that bothered me the most about Ron DeSantis showing up there, we knew he was there for the photo op, but one of the, the, the politicians or city council members was there calming the crowd down, saying, you know, that we're going to get this party started. We're going to take the gifts because he's here to bring them. And that was just embarrassing and disgraceful. And his people People like that who enable Ron DeSantis, you know, true leadership, that woman should have said, hey, these are your constituents too. address them. You calm them down. Let them feel the rage. But as long as we have people who can kind of serve as go-betweens, because maybe they fear some type of retribution from Ron DeSantis because he's been very active as it relates to targeting people who don't represent his views in, in that state. Maybe that's part of the reason. But as long as we continue to have politicians who are not going to fully stand up to him and let the people speak, we're going to continue to see situations situations like this where he can just show up, get the photo op, and then basically say, you know, I know black people, I, I can talk to black people. And going back to this whole situation with the with the um, drawing of the redistricting uh, redistrict and the like, well, we, my issue with all of these states and what the courts are saying is, the enforcement. The Supreme Court can come down with something, a state court can come down with something, but who's going to enforce it? If this goes to the Florida Supreme Court, Ron DeSantis picked most of those judges. And so how do these things get enforced? The same conversation with Trump and the 14th Amendment. So we're happy to see the rulings, but if these guys just choose to not care, what are they gonna not have an election in 2024? I can't see that happening. These guys wanna delay, delay, delay uh, until the next election happens, and then they're just gonna keep it moving. I just really think at the end of the day, we need to let the people speak, not get in the way of their voices, and not let Ron DeSantis think he can just walk in. But he's doing what Trump did the entire time as well. No respect for our community beyond the photo op. Yeah, and the Florida situation is particularly troubling, Professor Walker, because this is a state court that made this ruling. So we can expect it will be appealed. And as Dr. Dabinga says, it's probably going to go up to the Florida State Supreme Court. Then it's going to make its way over to the federal system and probably go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So I'm a little concerned. What is that map going to look like when we get to voting in 2024, given all of the legal wrangling that we know is left to be done? Now, the Alabama situation is slightly different because of court said, you all have defied us in such a way. We're not going to even give you Alabama legislators a, a chance to get it right again. We're going to give it to an independent party, which we know the Alabama uh, GOP legislators, that's what they wanted. They said they'd rather it be given to someone else uh, than have it on their record that they created a district that gave Blacks uh, voting power in that state. That's That's how reprehensible they thought it would be for them to draw a fair map. But what do you expect to happen in Florida? Because we're going to run out of time. And I think you're right, Dr. Dabinga, this is all about running out the clock for this 2024 election. 
Yeah, it, you know, it, it, my colleague hit, hit it right on the nose. You know, this is going to go to the Florida Supreme Court, and the governor has, <laughs> you know, you know, appointed those individuals on the court. So, and I saw someone tweet the other day, well, recently, last 24 hours, is see if they do the moral thing. And so, because I know a lot of times we talk about not only in terms of what's right legally, but what's right morally for democracy in the United States. And that is certainly, like I said, once again, not eliminating Black folks' ability to have a representative in Congress, whether it's Congress or the White House or whether it's at the state level. But once again, the former Confederate states are at it again, Areva, in terms of once again turning back the clock. But you're right about turn, you know, about the timeline in terms of between now and November 2024. We're running out of time here. And so this is a delay tactic. Tactic. We also have to highlight, because I believe it was Alabama, we even had some of the state reps acknowledge that they talked to Speaker McCarthy about maintaining the majority. So we have to really be clear about what this is about. The Republicans, at least in terms of the, the cases we talked about, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, flipped, you know, added black congressional districts. We know the chances are they're not going to be able to hold on the majority in 2024. So this is about power, or as the locks used to talk about, money, power, and respect back in the day. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're dealing with right now. You know what's so troubling, and I didn't really plan to talk about this because I'm so irritated by these stories, but let's talk about it because I think it's, it's on the table now. And that's these recent polls out and these recent articles that say the elite Democrats are, are excited about Biden, but the rank and file Democratic Party is unenthused and uh, wish there was some other candidate other than Joe Biden. And when you see these stories about voting rights and gerrymandering and all of these efforts to undermine our political power, to think that there are Democrats, and I don't know who these, I guess we would be considered these elite Democrats that want <laughs> Joe Biden. Uh, you know, th- this notion, though, that we have time to get into a fight about Joe Biden when there is so much else at stake. When we come forward, I just want to talk about what both of you think of these notions or these stories that are out there that rank and file Democrats don't want Joe Biden again for president. I also want to talk about this 22 year sentence for a proud boy leader and Gloria Johnson. Does she have a chance of unseating GOP uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn in Ruby red, Tennessee? Stay with us. KBLA talk 1580. Race, social justice, sports, politics, art, music, culture. We do it all on the D.L. Hughley Afternoon Show. If you're not tuning in, then you are definitely missing out. It's the D.L. Hughley Afternoon Show weekdays from 2 to 4 only on unapologetically progressive KBLA Talk 15. Like a brand new flavor in your head. This is a rather bold pronouncement, but we think we can back it up. Back it up. Back it up. If you come across a radio frequency anywhere, putting more variety and more diversity on the air than KBLA Talk 1580, we sure would like to hear about your discovery. You got to have vision. You can search. We are confident that you won't find more shows covering more topics, hosted by a more diverse and inclusive lineup of talkers than the squad we have assembled here at KBLA Talk 1580. This is the time, brothers. This is the time. We've got something for everybody. That's right. Health and healing, history and humor, issues and events, empowerment and entertainment, all in one station. What's really going on? Free enterprise, you did. KBLA Talk 1580. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got a lot to talk about. King Kong ain't got on me, on me, on me. If you're not listening to Tavis Smiley weekday mornings on KBLA Talk 1580, you're missing out. Everybody wants to talk to Tavis. That's one reason, by the way, why I'm so thrilled to have this conversation with you today. The three people I always most hoped would interview me were Phil Donahue, Studs Turkle, and Tavis Smiley. Donahue's retired, Turkle's deceased, so this is a real thrill for me. And the, the reason why I have such respect for what you do is you have a historically informed conversation of depth and detail. Be sure to tune in to Tavis Smiley, weekday mornings, 9 a.m. to 12 noon, on your unapologetically progressive radio station, KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580. Is the pen mightier than the sword? They say the pen is mightier than the sword. At KBLA Talk 1580, we not only have a lot to talk about, we have a lot to write about. 
politics, relationships, business, empowerment, and culture. The all-star roster at KBLA Talk 1580 has you covered. That's what it's all about. Be sure to follow us on all our socials for our latest book releases, op-eds, essays, and commentaries from our hosts. And, of course, download the KBLA 1580 app as we strive to remain your most trusted, credible, and reliable source for the issues you care about. This this is unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 1580. What up, baby? At KBLA Talk 1580, we do more than just talk. Hey there, I'm Jared Hill, president of the National Association of Black Journalists of Los Angeles, and I just want to say thank you for the benevolent $10,000 donation and scholarships for the next generation of black journalists. And I'm Haywood Galbraith, photojournalist and founder of the Minority Photojournalism Institute. Thanks, KBLA, for your generous $10,000 scholarship gift to help us train the next generation of black photojournalists. Congratulations to all the students who will benefit from the scholarship dollars raised at our Black History Month luncheon, honoring black legends in L.A. media. When we come forward, at KBLA Talk 1580, we're bringing everybody with us. Everybody with us. Access granted. In a survey conducted by the public opinion research firm Eviterus, KBLA Talk 1580 consistently emerged as the station of choice for black audiences in the Los Angeles media market and beyond. The survey also revealed that the vast majority of black audiences are concerned about the lack of black-owned media and are more likely to listen to talk radio that focuses on issues that impact the black community. For some reason, the other talk stations haven't quite figured that out. If you think about KFI, well, KFI only has like a 3% black listenership. 3%. So there's a good 97% out there to support a station like KBLA. At KBLA Talk 1580, we've got your we've black. Got your black. Your black. Follow the leader. KBLA Talk 1580. Follow the leader. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at KBLA 1580. Follow the leader. Are you ready? Are you ready? The station leading the way with exclusive interviews. Follow the leader. Stimulating conversation leader. and intellectual discourse that empowers, enlightens, and informs. Follow the leader. Follow the leader at KBLA 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Keep following the leader. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. Gotta stay fresh, ma. Ma. Hell shot with a rest spa. Shot with a rest spa. Shot with a rest spa. Have you visited us online for the grand opening of KBLA.store? For the best in new merch, gift ideas, books, media, and more, log on to KBLA.store. Be sure to check out our KBLA team favorites at KBLA.store today. That's KBLA.store for all the official merch on your favorite talk radio station. KBLA Talk 1580. Race, social justice, sports, politics, art, music, culture. We do it all on the D.L. Hughley Afternoon Show. If you're not tuning in, then you are definitely missing out. It's the D.L. Hughley Afternoon Show weekdays from 2 to 4 only on unapologetically progressive KBLA Talk 15. Like a brand new flavor in your head. We are back, and this is Ariva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Ariva Martin. And in this hour, we are tracking today's trending news with my expert contributors. And in hour two, we are talking about the U.S. Supreme Court and asking, is it time for an overall of the court, given the revelations about uh, perks and money and trips that have passed hands between two, in particular, Supreme Court justices and wealthy Republican donors and this recent interview by Justice Samuel Alito, where he basically says the court is off limits, is untouchable, that no entity uh, in our governmental structure can impose any regulations or ethics requirements on Supreme Court justices. Is that really so? Can Supreme Court justices operate as nine individual kings and queens? Going to be talking to some Supreme Court scholars about that in hour two. So make sure you stick around. 
All right, Dr. Dominga and Dr. Walker, I said I didn't really want to talk about these polls, but I guess these polls are out there. This Washington Post poll that says 73% of Americans say that Joe Biden is too old and that two-thirds of Democrats say that he's too old. There's actually a, a, a Democratic Congress member, I have to look up his name, who is calling on uh, someone to primary Joe Biden. So I just, I, I'm just wondering where are Democrats? Like, what are we thinking when we see these cases around gerrymandering and the elimination of black voting power by GOP legislators? And then someone like Ron DeSantis, who's a uh, governor, wants to be president. Why are Democrats picking a fight with Joe Biden over his age? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Dabinga. It's 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 silly season now, and it's frustrating because it's only going to get worse. And it's very interesting because when you know Don Lemon was talking about you know Nikki Haley being you know past her prime and everything, it was an ignorant comment, it was a sexist comment, and the like. But what I find is that people have no problem being ageist. They have no because most of the people who are on running news shows and newscasts, you know, are under the age of 60. So whether it's male, female, even Nikki Haley herself, who's been the victim of sexist attacks, has no problem being ages. Oh, he can't remember the names of his own kids and so on and so forth. And Democrats are joining in that. And look, people are talking about Donald Trump being finished and Republicans being finished as they're eating each other. But we know all it takes is people to just pick away a few votes here and there. So we're going to start seeing the age thing come up, even though he's only three years older than Trump. Republicans never talk about age. We're going to see these attacks about Kamala Harris coming up as well. Oh, her record in California. Black men don't support her. They're going to bring up every single thing. And then, of course, we got Cornel West, who, who's not running as a Democrat, but, you know, can pick off some votes. And we recently learned that Jill Stein, the spoiler from, you know, the last time is going to be supporting him in his campaign. And so you pick off this, you pick off that, you pick off that. Trump's base stays solid, even though it's not growing. And anything can happen. I'm glad Bernie Sanders shut down some of that conversation um, this past weekend for again stop comparing him to the almighty compare him to the alternative look democrats independents look at your student loans those of y'all who got relief look at the infrastructure plan as biden said this last weekend for trump infrastructure week was a running joke throughout his entire presidency look at the results look at what's happening in your community look at what's happening with the roads with the schools with money going into your pocket look at those things young people and then that's the person you choose to vote for but ariva we are just going to see this more and more and more because the mainstream media they thrive off of this type yeah. of deception yeah they don't want there to be uh, a coronation for any candidate they don't want any candidate to go uncontested so because there's no candidate uh contesting joe biden in a serious way they've got to now put pit joe biden against himself i.e you know him as uh, a man that is over 80 years old and you're right dr Dabinga, about the mainstream media because i was looking at a couple articles and the photographs, Donald Trump, who is just three years younger. So, you know, that means essentially once you pass 21, anybody that's three years older or younger, you're the same age. Yep. But they have this picture of Donald Trump where he looks almost 10 years younger and poor Joe Biden looks 10 years older. Mm -hmm. So the media is playing into these images that right. even though there's a three-year difference that somehow Joe Biden is this feeble, fragile you know, almost, uh, you know, demented character. And then, That's right. uh, you know, Trump, and we saw with that mugshot, his purposeful, you know, uh, frown, scowl on his face to look like this tough guy, this, this you know, uh, tough kingpin of, of sorts. <laughs> he was leaning into that. And uh, Dr. Walker, it, it is obviously impacting the people who are responding to these polls. You know, you're always a suspect about polls. Who are they talking to? Are they talking to people of color? Are they talking to women? Are they talking to young people? So I don't put a lot of stock in these polls, but I am concerned about the, the drumbeat of the message and Democrats starting to buy into it. I didn't hear uh, Bernie Sanders say that, but I think that's a brilliant statement. And I, I think I'm going to adopt it to start telling people, you know, forget these not don't compare them to the almighty, compare them to the alternative. But we know, Dr. Walker, that a lot of people, that's not enough to get them motivated to go out and vote. They need, you know, the Obama hope posters and they need that very inspiring message. And it's not enough just to say, well, he's better than the next guy. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that we're living in a different time, you know, so everyone spends time on their phones, 
on TikTok, Twitter, et cetera, watching, you know, obviously where some of us are picking like us or, you know, who are academics or, you know, researchers, et cetera, law experts are looking for that important information. But let's be honest, the majority of Americans are looking to be entertained. Um, and so I think that that's a factor. So, and you're right, you know, Joe Biden may have the sizzle that, you know, President Obama had, but it's interesting, even when you see how active President, President um, Biden is, I mean, he bicycles, et cetera. You certainly don't see- He gets no president. credit for that. He gets none. <laughs> no. uh, they, right. They'll focus on, well, he's taking a shorter set of steps on Air Force right. One than the longer set of steps. But you're right. He's out there. He's bicycling. He's walking. He's a very active 80-year-old man. He is. And, you know, this is another other factor in this is that the media, as you saw mainstream media, has failed America over the last, well, I could argue for decades, but certainly over the last, you know, eight years, they have failed the country to really be able to articulate a lot of different issues about what's going on and also to stop both sides, everything. Well, you know, Biden's really old. That's the only thing they don't both sides. You know, that you talk about the three-year age difference. Everything else is both sides with Biden and, and Trump, um, particularly some of the radical positions. But this particular issue, they don't both sides. It's just like, well, you know, President Biden mm -hmm. is just an old guy, but Trump is 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 45 years old. But <laughs> oh, yeah. in reality, it, it, they're, they're, they're on the same age group. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, but there's not, a, like I said, the mainstream media has really done a poor job. Also, the bottom line is I have to offer a critique to the Democratic Party. Because the Republican Party is better at propaganda. I saw that when I worked on the Hill, and that has continued today. They continue to beat on the same issues that really don't take care of, don't help Americans. Right. But somehow they're able to popularize it. And the Democratic Party, with the Inflation Reduction Act, Infrastructure Bill, what also the DOJ has done in terms of going after corruption, those are the things that they haven't, they haven't been able to break through the ecosystem. No, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, we spend a lot of time fighting each other in our Big Ten party rather than directing, you know, our uh, rightful anger about what's happening uh, in our country towards the Republicans. Real quickly, uh, Dr. Davinga, Gloria Johnson, do you think she has any chance of unseating Marsha Blackburn in Tennessee? I would have said no if it wasn't for what happened, you know, over the last few months in terms of how they silenced her and the two Joneses, uh, Jones and, Pier and Pearson. Uh, I believe that uh, they have made these people into superstars. I believe that they've galvanized a lot of young people who are going to turn 18 by the next election. And I believe Pearson is actually serving on her campaign as well. If they go hard and Marsha Blackburn continue to be as ineffective as she is, I think anything is possible. They're going to have to do like Obama did, bringing new voters as opposed to relying on the Republicans of old. Yeah, it's a good point. We know that that's how Georgia has become a purple state by, uh, and we got Senator Warnock uh, as a result of that because they registered new voters and they didn't think that you could elect uh, not one, but two Democratic senators in the state of Georgia. So, you know, kudos to uh, Gloria for throwing, Gloria Johnson, Representative Gloria Johnson for throwing her hat in the ring. We know you can't win if you don't run. So right. you got to start someplace. When we come forward, I want to talk about this uh, report out that Americans, including Gen Z and their parents, say poo-poo to higher education. I don't know, maybe you guys will have to find new professions <laughs> if folks are going to stop going to college. <laughs> but I want to know where all these high school graduates getting jobs and what kind of jobs these are and what does this say for the Black community in particular? Because, you know, I don't know if these stats are going to hold true for our community. When we come forward, we're going to talk about uh, Americans' dislike, distrust, and distaste for higher education right here on KBLA Talk 1580. Talk 1580, we do more than just talk. Hey there, I'm Jared Hill, president of the National Association of Black Journalists of Los Angeles, and I just want to say thank you for the benevolent $10,000 donation and scholarships for the next generation of black journalists. And I'm Haywood Galbraith, photojournalist and founder of the Minority Photojournalism Institute. Thanks, KBLA, for your generous $10,000 scholarship gift to help us train the next generation of black photojournalists. Congratulations to all the students who will benefit from the scholarship dollars raised at our Black History Month luncheon 
honoring black legends in L.A. media. When we come forward at KBLA Talk 1580, we're bringing everybody with us. Everybody with us. In a survey conducted by the public opinion research firm Eviteris, KBLA Talk 1580 consistently emerged as the station of choice for black audiences in the Los Angeles media market and beyond. The survey also revealed that the vast majority of black audiences are concerned about the lack of black owned media and are more likely to listen to talk radio that focuses on issues that impact the black community. For some reason, the other talk stations haven't quite figured that out. If you think about KFI, well, KFI only has like a 3% black listenership. 3%. So there's a good 97% out there to support a station like KBLA. At KBLA Talk 1580, we've got your we've black. Got your black. Your black. Follow the leader. KBLA Talk 1580. Follow the leader. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at KBLA 1580. Follow the leader. Are you ready? Are you ready? The station leading the way with exclusive interviews. Follow the leader. Stimulating conversation. Leader. Intellectual discourse that empowers, enlightens, and informs. Follow the leader. Follow the leader at KBLA 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Keep following the leader. Follow 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 the leader. Gotta stay fresh, ma. Ma. Have you visited us online for the grand opening of KBLA.store? For the best in new merch, gift ideas, books, media, and more, log on to KBLA.store. Be sure to check out our KBLA team favorites at KBLA.store today. That's KBLA.store for all the official merch on your favorite talk radio station. KBLA Talk race social justice sports politics art music culture we do it all on the dl hughley afternoon show if you're not tuning in then you are definitely missing out it's the dl hughley afternoon show weekdays from two to four only on unapologetically progressive kbla talk 15 a brand new flavor in your head yeah this is a rather bold pronouncement, but we think we can back it up. Back it up. Back it up. If you come across a radio frequency anywhere, putting more variety and more diversity on the air than KBLA Talk 1580, we sure would like to hear about your decision. Dr. Dabinga, this new article in the New York Times today about the fact that Americans' feelings about higher education has, uh, our feelings have turned sharply negative and citing a poll where the percentage of young adults who said that a college degree is important fell to 41% from 74%. How did that strike you as someone who works in higher education and who values education? It's, it's, it's tough to read. It's tough to see. Uh, it's not surprising. You know, I have uh, you know, my older children, our high school students, one a senior and you know, looking at colleges and, and the like. And But I feel like what now people are seeing nowadays is the incentive structure is changing and they're seeing people make a lot of money without any type of education. Not only, you know, musicians and athletes, but now you have professional video game leagues or you could become an influencer on YouTube and get advertising and all of these types of things so people are thinking these things are quick fixes they think that they can just do it and they don't really see the need for school and then on the flip side i forget what this is called but i'm just going to call it the tuition gap um so i remember the real name but in many of our uh, the degree there's an issue with degrees where you're paying the same tuition to go to school and one person studying business and the other person studying english you're going to make significantly more money in general with a business degree but you're going to both have those loans. So, you know, you go into business, engineering, become a doctor, you may pay off those things or make more money. Whereas if you're in the humanities, you may not make as much. I think that's also a problem that, that people could be seeing as well. You know, there's YouTube University, people just feel, I'm just going to go and learn everything there. And so I think that those are real issues. And then, of course, the cost of school. Why do that when you can just get famous on YouTube or TikTok, even though that doesn't happen for everybody? We are just in a society that increasingly has less value for education we're not showing the real benefits of it yeah you're so right and when you dig into the story what they also show dr walker is that 
it's not just about the income differential between high school graduates and college graduates, but they went into a wealth analysis and they looked at what is the relative wealth difference between those that graduated from college and those that did not have college uh, degrees. And particularly uh, amongst uh, you know certain demographics, there wasn't a major wealth difference. And they looked at you know income minus expenses and determined what someone's wealth was and. Dr. Dabinga uh, talks about the high cost of, of college these days, the student loan debt that can cause one's wealth to be substantially diminished. You know, it doesn't matter how much you make, it's how much you spend, right? So if you're spending a fortune on your student loan debts, your 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 wealth, your relative wealth, you know, your your income after expenses can be relatively low. But have we done such a poor job that knowledge? Just you know, the, the 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 importance of knowledge gathering has been diminished in this country. That people don't value uh, being just educated. I think the attacks on higher education have worked. You know, I mentioned the word. I talked about propaganda and misinformation earlier. You know, we've heard in the state of Florida, and other places, the the war on woke. It is essentially there's a there's a war on this, on this, you know discussing issues in, in, in this country's long history relating to racism. And secondly, it is also the idea that it's an attack on elitism. And it's yeah. been effective, but it's been effective for our own detriment. Well, let me ask you this. You, you raised something important. Do you think this war uh, is designed to stunt the application process, the you know desire on the part of blacks to gain education, because when people gain education, they you know they do gain knowledge, and they you know once we once you get that knowledge, you're more likely to challenge systems than when you don't have that knowledge. So is this kind of a secondary motive behind this attack? You think it's 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 a fight. It's anti-intellectualism. This is basically what it is. And it is also, but I guess I'm again, asking, do you think this, and both either of you can weigh in on this, Dr. DeBingo or Dr. Walker, is it a part of this to prevent black or to cause black people in particular to say, I don't need college, I can become a TikTok star, I can become this kind of you know influencer, yeah. knowing that in the long run, we don't have the same luxury to do that as white families, many of them making the decision may have uh, trust of counts they may have family that own homes or businesses mm -hmm. so they are in a different financial position so i'm just wondering what do you think dr Dabinga? do you think a part of this war on woke is designed to keep black folks from reading keep us dumb and stupid in the way we were during slavery Yo, oh, absolutely. And I mean, and look what they're doing in Texas. Look what they did in Houston, taking some of our schools and turning them into, you know, mini prisons or, you know, they call them team centers now, but they were basically detention centers where like 20 schools no longer have libraries. So, you know, they're removing incentives towards education at every level and they're claiming they're helping these kids, but the alternatives are going to be to turn towards the streets, turn towards entertainment and the like to not make academics look accessible and to not make it look cool. And then they're going to keep bringing us people who are ignorant like the Herschel Walkers of the world and say, you know, you can be like this guy. Of course, you know, I've heard, this is, it's, it's only the last year or two that I've always had people question like, oh, how did you, you know, get a degree or whatever, you know, as, you know all of us experience that as black people. But what's been different is that now people are making a difference between whether you got a medical degree versus like a PhD in education like I have. You, you know, that whole Tucker Carlson thing, you're not a real doctor. You know, uh, Jill Biden is not a real doctor. So it, it, it's like Larry's saying, they're trying to stomp on every aspect of intellectualism to make it not look cool, to make it not look appealing, not realizing that that's been one of the best ways for black people to get to the next level. And a lot of our young people are buying this. And lastly, in my class on cultural appropriation or appreciation, we talk about these influencers. A lot of these black content creators are getting their ideas stolen by white people with bigger resources who are the ones who are really getting famous off of that. So we got to think twice on that too. Yeah, and address that, Dr. Walker. This again, what what concerns me about this is do we have the luxury in the black community to say you can get a col get a high school diploma and do just fine? No, because you look at all the you know economic indicators, you know, regardless of how educated of us as three highly educated folks on this conversation, we are statistically still more likely to have make less money than our counterparts and be less likely to have come have money 
resources, whether it's savings, investment for Okay, so then that's property. the argument for the high school students as well. Look at those three smart, broke people. So why should I go? <laughs> but listen, why do I need listen, to go to Ariba, college? I don't want to be like them. <laughs> but Ariba, it's about systemic racism, right? Mm -hmm. So we, this is a, th this whole conversation would have to really be contextualized because I could have a conversation about redlining about why we're here today having this conversation. We also, and we know is because we, you know we're my colleague in our higher education. We know as as relates to Black folks, getting the degree helps with your social mobility. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm at UCF. Our institution is great at that. Taking mm -hmm. first generation students getting a college degree and helping with social mobility. So we know statistically, if you get a college degree and you're black and from other minority backgrounds, you're more likely to do well. It's just that you're pushing against, um, uh, uh, you're pushing against 400 plus years of policies aimed at preventing you from from, from gaining wealth. And that's really what, right. what's going on here in terms of why the challenges in the black community. But once again, it's an attack on, on intellectualism. It is also an attack on. Uh, you know, talking about race, talking about gender, um, talking about gender equity, pay equity, and attacks on unions. These are all part of the same right. policies that have consistently happened for decades. And and real quickly, Dr. DeBing, I think you're right. You're talking about that comparison of medical doctors versus someone who has a, a PhD like the two of you. I, I even hear some of my black friends who are doctors and lawyers say they don't want their kids to go get law degrees or medical degrees because they're going to have a lot of student debt and they're not going to make a lot of money. And my question to that is, okay, well, what job are they getting? So it's all very relative, right? You may, may not be the richest person on the block, but what is the job of a high school diploma person versus someone with a college degree? So they could be super wealthy, like the athlete or entertainer, but they are more likely to have a middle-class lifestyle, buy a home, you know, have a car and have health insurance, some of the basic things in this country versus that person who doesn't. So I think we have to, as you know, contextualize it and we got to keep it real in terms of you know, not comparing it to the almighty, as you said, but to the alternative. Real quickly, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Uh, Dabinga? No, I think absolutely. That whole idea of well, what are you going to do if you don't go to school is is real. And we have to help people map out careers. So many of us think short-term, four-year careers in the, in the league or this or that. Long-term careers. The most wealthy people in this society who are Black are not athletes. We just don't hear their stories. And then lastly, this also connects to what's happening with schools because as they're ripping our history from the classroom, it's going to make Black kids more disinterested in school and less likely to pursue higher education as well. Great point. We are out of time. I am so much smarter when I spend an hour with Dr. Larry Walker and Dr. Omikongo Dabinga. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me. I will see you soon. And in hour two, we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court and its stance uh, that says you know, they are basically untouchable, that they can do whatever and not suffer any consequences, even if it means uh, overseeing cases that have individuals where they've taken financial perks. When we come forward and talk about the Supreme Court and ask the question, is it time for a complete overhaul of our court? Right here on KBLA Talk 1580. Talk 1580, we do more than just talk. Hey there, I'm Jared Hill, president of the National Association of Black Journalists of Los Angeles, and I just want to say thank you for the benevolent $10,000 donation and scholarships for the next generation of black journalists. And I'm Haywood Galbraith, photojournalist and founder of the Minority Photojournalism Institute. Thanks, KBLA, for your generous $10,000 scholarship gift to help us train the next generation of black photojournalists. Congratulations to all the students who will benefit from the scholarship dollars raised at our Black History Month luncheon. Honoring black legends in L.A. media. When we come forward at KBLA Talk 1580, we're bringing everybody with us. Everybody with us. Everybody.